Welcome to our oral history project. We're very fortunate today that we're able to interview Major General Retired Dr. Carla Hawley Bolin. Carla has been an active member of ACOG while in the Armed Forces, and it is extremely pleasurable for me to be able to interview her today. So welcome, Carla. Thank, thank you, you for coming. We appreciate it. Well, thank you, Ralph. We'd like to know a little bit about you. So we'd like to start with a little bit, and let's go all the way back to the very beginning and find out where you were born. I was born in Casper, Wyoming. Went to the, uh, through the school system there, went to the same high school as my father. Uh, graduated, went to Colorado State University for undergraduate, and decided to go to medical school. And got accepted to Creighton University, but couldn't pay for it, so uh, applied for the Health Profession Scholarship Program with the Armed Services, and uh, accepted the Air Force, because they were the only ones that got me the paperwork in time. Uh, went to medical school, met my husband-to-be there, uh, Warren Boland, who was an Army brat through and through, and then a West Point graduate, and was then going to medical school. So uh, in the process, transferred to the Army eventually uh, while we were going through that process. And uh, so ended up in the Army, even though the Air Force paid well, for medical school. Let me take school. you back a little bit backwards then and tell okay. me, what made you decide you wanted to be a physician? Well, I tried out the sciences because I always liked math and science throughout all my school studies. And then in trying biochemistry and some of the sciences at Colorado State University, I liked the study in microbiology and got into that and had a great mentor. And so I decided, you know what, medicine would tie all of these sciences together. I like taking care of people and so decided to give medicine a try. And then when I was at Creighton, I had great mentors in OBGYN, and it was my first rotation in my third year of medical school that sort of cemented that. It happened to be OBGYN. I found out I loved reading about it, loved studying it, loved taking care of women. Uh, Sister Janet was the one, uh, she was a nun and a nurse, and taught me how to, you know, gown and gown myself sterilely all by myself, get ready for that delivery. We had great hands-on experience. Seb Farrell was one of the residents there and was one of my mentors there, and I decided that that was what I was going to go into from the very start. Uh, I just loved taking care of women, doing obstetrics, doing surgery, loved all the aspects of it, and it became my passion. At that time, you were probably one of very few women that were residents in OBGYN. Um, very few. I was uh, the only, we had no uh, females in the residency program at Creighton. And, uh, but we had quite a few females in our, we, well, not very uh, many in our medical school class. We only had 16 out of 110. But we had quite a few that decided to go into OBGYN uh, out of that a uh, few number, we actually had four that went into OBGYN. Uh, one is still a great friend of mine, Ingrid Wilbrand Connolly, and we keep in touch. But um, we uh, loved uh, the rotations, and I got a great experience with lots of hands on uh, deliveries, uh, et cetera, while I was at Creighton. And so it just further cemented my decision. Where did you take your residency? Well, it was funny, I didn't match in OBGYN uh, when I applied for the match. And I didn't match in the military system, and so I went with a civilian match, did not match into OBGYN. So I went and did a general surgery internship in Sinai Hospital in Baltimore because I was trying to match in the same area of my country uh, as Warren did, and he matched at uh, Walter Reed. And so I matched at Sinai Hospital in Baltimore. And it was actually at the same hospital that I had put as number one for my OBGYN. And they had an opening in general surgery, so they had my file up there, and they looked at it, and they needed general surgery interns, so they took me. But it actually was a blessing in disguise, uh, because I had a 200 case list when I finished internship. I learned pre- and post-op care that I wouldn't have learned elsewhere. And uh, it was a great experience. They tried to keep me in general surgery, but I wanted to go back to my first love. And in that time, I was transferring from the Air Force to the Army. 
I then became a general medical officer in the Army and worked at Fort Meade for a year. And they sent me all the women's health issues because I was in an acute minor illness clinic and ran the emergency room. And then matched at Walter Reed into the OBGYN program as an extra. And Bob Park, who's the past president, uh, took me into his program at Walter Reed. Now, once you finished in Walter Reed, what was your first uh, duties assignment after that? I went to Fort Hood, and Fort Hood had 45,000 active duty troops, which was a tenth of the Army, stationed there. And in the Army, deliveries are the number one business. It's the number one diagnosis in the Army, and it still is today. And we were doing over 300 deliveries a month. We were number one in the Army. We set the record. We actually got ahead of Tripler, which used to be number one. And I set the record there. When I was 32 weeks pregnant myself, I did 45 deliveries in 72 hours, and I filled up the hospital. I had moms and babies not only on the postpartum ward, I had them on the female surgery ward, pediatrics, and orthopedics. I bet they loved you. <laughs> But we cleaned out after 48 hours. We were all back to business as usual. But uh, we had seven ORs a week. We had a lot of surgery as well as uh, babies. Uh, we had neonatologists so we could do high risk OB. And so it was wonderful after residency because with that experience, you could cement your skills and really become an accomplished obst obstetrician gynecologist. What were your plans at that time? in terms of your future. You know, a lot of people enter the military, they put in their years, pay back, and then they're out and in the civilian community. So what were you thinking at that time? Well, at that time, I had planned to pay back my four years and get out. But I loved what I was doing at Fort Hood. I loved the patients. Uh, I loved the lifestyle. Uh, my husband was military uh, through and through, so he didn't really know a thing about civilian life at all. And so he wanted to stay in, and so I liked what I was doing, so didn't see a good reason to get out. We stayed four years at Fort Hood, and then we were transferred to William Beaumont because they needed someone to run the trauma service in general surgery. And Warren saw enough trauma uh, with the training at Fort Hood that they put him in that position. Um, it was a new opportunity for me because then I began uh, extra training of residents, uh, specifically our own residency at William Beaumont Army Medical Center. I had experience training residents at Fort Hood because they rotated from Brook Army Medical Center and then we also had them from Wilford Hall, the Air Force, and then we had family practice residents as well because of our caseload. Uh, but at William Beaumont, uh, we were there nine years, and I trained OBGYN residents there for nine years and eventually became the program director and the department chair. Then where was your next duty station? Well, after uh, William Beaumont, uh, there I was also, you know, the women's health issues consultant and the OBGYN consultant. And then I took a change uh, with my career track. I thought I was going to stay in academic medicine for a very, for forever. I was going to just finish my Army career there. And then I got asked to try administrative medicine and go up and be the deputy commander at Fort Bragg. And that would be a deputy commander of the hospital. And initially I said, no, I want to stay in academic medicine. And uh, the guy that asked me, Tom Auer, was an old friend of mine. And he said, no, I'm not going to take no for an answer. I want you to think about it. And an issue came up that I was going to have to do a fight, a long fight, and argue with the same people that I had to argue with before. And I decided, you know, I need to try something new. I need new fights and new people to fight with. And I decided to take the job. And so I became the deputy commander for clinical services at Fort Bragg Hospital. But I was still able to practice, because Fort Bragg also has 40,000 troops and a lot of deliveries. And I was able to help junior staff with their cases as well, especially the more difficult ones, because they were fresh out of residency, and so I staffed them on the more difficult cases. And after that, I got picked up for command. And so after two years, I went on to Fort Leonard Wood, commanded the hospital there, then went back to William Beaumont and commanded the hospital there, and then went to Fort Sam and had a staff job uh, with the AMED as the Clinical Services Division 
and then also became the chief consultant at the Surgeon General where I was in charge of all the consultants. So I was over all the consultants and I thought I was going to retire there, finish out working there and staying on because they asked me to stay on. But then surprise, surprise, I got picked up for Brigadier General. Was not expecting that, uh, but got picked up and so then went on to command. I, I think picked up as being a little, uh, I think you were selected well, because selected. of a bitty. Uh, yeah, it's <laughs> called picked up, but uh, was I selected. Know. And uh, so went on to command European Regional Medical Command where I had all the medical care for 11 countries in Europe. And then uh, did that for two years and then went to Pacific and had all the countries of the Pacific Rim was responsible for all that medical care and commanded Tripler. And then uh, got pulled out of that early uh, and went to Walter Reed and Northern Region Medical Command had the whole Northeast uh, and commanded Walter Reed as well as all the hospitals was over the medical care for that and ended up closing Walter Reed and opening the new Walter Reed at Bethesda and Belvoir. And while I was at Tripler I got promoted to two stars, Major General. And uh, that sort of summed up the career of 32 years in the Army. But the nice thing about being in the Army is while I commanded, I maintained clinical skills and since pelvic surgery and vaginal surgery was my love, my passion, and my skill set as far as training residents, I continued to do that throughout my career. And even at Walter Reed, even uh, when I gave up command at the end of July in June, I was still going in on vaginal hysterectomies and teaching the tricks of the trade. Let me take you back now to the time where you must have been one of the very first women physicians that was moving in this type of a uh, cycle up through the command. How did you feel and how were you treated by the regular army folks that are mostly male? Well, it was a new experience for them. Uh, at Leonard Wood, we actually had the first all-girl command in a hospital. Uh, all my deputies were also female, except for my sergeant major, and we got the label, the Spice Girls. <laughs> and we all had our names. I was Scary Spice, and so they called my sergeant major Old Spice because he had the Spice Girls. Uh, but we did quite well. I went to the staff meeting, and I had a great commander, uh, Robert Flowers, who was an engineer. And he was very fair, and uh, they all talked in all their acronyms, all their abbreviations. And they all gave a report, and I was not understanding a word they said. So when it came to my turn to talk about the medical, I talked all in medical acronyms. And they're all looking at me like, what are you saying? We do not understand a word of it. And they said, Carla, what did you say? And I said, well, you all talked in acronyms, and I didn't understand you, but I thought that was the standard so I'm talking in my acronyms. So after that they went, oh, so then they all started explaining what they were talking about. So that was a good laugh. But I uh, went on road races with them. I did the road marches. We did 26 mile road marches. I did that with them and when I proved I could hang with them, uh, keep up with them uh, and become their friend, I invited them into meetings, took care of their troops, when they had questions about how their troops were being taken care of, uh, then uh, became friends with all the, my fellow commanders, I didn't have a problem. And I have found that I was, had been treated by the Army very equally uh, throughout the career. But I did get a funny call when it was time for my command to end, and they were bringing in another female commander and more female deputies. They called me and they said, do you think Fort Leonard would is ready for another all-girl command? And I asked them back and I said, do you ask the boys the same question? And I got very quiet on the other end of the phone and they said, never mind, and they hung up. <laughs> That's very good. <laughs> Let me take you back to your European command. During that time, we were in a uh, war in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. You had a lot of dealings with, by then, a lot of women that would come into the uh, army and now women were going into combat what kind of problems did you see with the women having to be in a combat situation well they do very well 
physically, they do the same training and they get up to snuff on that. But we have to deal with the problems of having periods in the field, of dealing with infections, and uh, we, have, we still have a problem with rapes that occur. Um, and so we have to deal with typical female issues. One of the uh, things with uh, Desert Storm that I had to deal with uh, was uh, just getting female supplies, uh, pads and tampons to females. When we deployed, we had to take all of that stuff with us on our own. Uh, they have a thing called sundry packs and they provide toilet paper, uh, they used to provide cigarettes for the guys, but they razor blades, all the, the toiletry supplies for males they had in a sundry pack. They didn't have that for females. And so I actually met with the logisticians at Fort Lee and we developed a female sundry pack, but it was just me in a room with all male loggies teaching them about periods, <laughs> about menstrual cycles, about, they learn more about vaginas than they ever cared to know. <laughs> <laughs> and why we needed different sizes and all the different products and everything. But we got a female sundry pack called Healthcare Pack 2 in the supply system so that females wouldn't have to carry a second duffel bag with a, you know, a year's supply of tampons and pads and everything that they needed to, so that they could have periods in the field. The other thing was to get information out to physicians' assistants, family practice uh, physicians, as well as OBGYNs on how to deal with birth control as well as to do away with cycles in the field. So if women wanted to go on continuous birth control or depo povera and get, do away with periods altogether so they wouldn't even have to deal with it in the field, how to get women on those cycles, get the pharmacy to dispense the right number and so that they had enough to carry them over during the entire deployment. We had to deal with that and get the word out. Also how to deal with infections and just the clothing because it's a male cut on the uniforms and so to tell them they wanted their pants a little baggy so not cut too tight so not to cut down on irritation which would lead to vaginal infections that sort of thing. The environment they're not always clean, how to keep themselves clean, etc. The other thing was uh, urinating in the field. Women will purposely, if they don't have good cover, will purposely dehydrate. They won't drink, so they don't have to pee in the field if there's not good cover. Uh, they'll, or they get UTIs because of that. They'll hold their urine, they'll get distended bladders, then they won't be able uh, to urinate. And so we actually researched using funnels uh, and used lady, um, Lady J's, uh, Freshettes, they're some of the devices developed by female backpackers on how to urinate with a funnel device through a fly so you don't have to drop your drawers and find cover uh, so you don't have to take all your gear off. And we actually found one, the Freshette, that worked the best in the field. We actually got that in the Army supply system as well. And especially uh, when you're driving down and there are mined areas and so they don't want people to get off the truck women were having to pee in coffee cans sitting in the front of a truck so the coffee can was on the floorboards and then with a poncho around them and if you've ever tried to hit a coffee can in a truck with a poncho and then stand up and not knock the thing over it's impossible and so with the funnel system the girls could stand on the running boards just like the guys and pee in the sand so it worked very well and I actually used them in the road marches that I went on so they were they worked very well. So we got that in the supply system as well. So those are some of the challenges. But once we, you overcome those, you make them equal to the guys, and then they do very well uh, in the field, and there's no difference. Had you not been an OBGYN, do you think you would have been able to understand and to be able to make these changes in the Army? No. Uh, I think my greatest contribution was the fact that I was an obstetrician gynecologist and I was a women's health advocate. And I was allowed to be the consultant for women's health and then the consultant in OBGYN. And I was able to push these issues through and be in the right, and I happened to be in the right place at the right time to get these issues through, to take care of them, to deal with the loggies, to do the, the research on the funnel system, to find out which one worked with the fly on the uniform, et cetera, to get all these things through and then to advocate and get the word out 
to the women so that we could make them equivalent to the guys and make it just as easy for them uh, to work in the field as with their male counterparts. And then it makes it easy because then they can go, they can pee through the fly like the, the guys can off the running boards or anywhere else. They don't need covers. Uh, and they can do it without periods so they don't have to worry about all that and then they're covered. And so the issues that the Army is dealing with now are rapes because they do happen. Um, people do get pregnant. They do have sexual regulations in the field. Uh, and that's another issue. When I was uh, the consultant for obstetrics and gynecology, I got the call, after what I called the call after Desert Storm. And uh, they said, we're going to kick out every girl that got pregnant during Desert Storm because it's against regulations to get pregnant in the field. And I said, well, it's not against regulations to get pregnant. It's against regulations to have sex in the field. And if you're going to kick all the girls out, okay, but then you have to kick out a guy for every girl you kick out because she didn't do it alone. <laughs> and then it got very quiet on the other side of the phone because I said, one guy for every girl you kick out, that's all I ask. It has to be fair. And so then they went, never mind, again. So that didn't happen either. So again, I was in the right place at the right time to protect those women because they were very adamant they were going to kick them all out, and that didn't happen. They probably won't recognize it, but you obviously have made a significant impact in the U.S. Army. <laughs> <laughs> Let me take you back to ACOG. When did you first get involved with ACOG? Bob Park got me involved when I was a resident. I actually had a paper uh, using lymphangiograms uh, in ovarian cancer and uh, presented a paper, put it together, and got it ready for presentation at ACOG. And he sent me to my first national meeting. And he's the one that got me involved. And he's the one that sent me every year. And I don't know if he saw something in me that you know I didn't see in myself. But then I just started coming to the meetings after I was assigned to Fort Hood, William Beaumont. And I kept our residents very active in research. Uh, as you know, the Armed Forces District, we do a lot of research and a lot of papers and uh, remained active and then uh, became uh, the vice chair and then the section chair uh, of the Army section and then uh, was lucky enough to become the vice chair and then the district chair uh, of the district and uh, participate in ACOG in that matter. Uh, so it was, uh, it was very exciting, but I've always enjoyed uh, ACOG. But Bob Park was the one that got me started in that very early. Now that you have retired, what are your plans for the future? Well, right now, I'm a Red Cross volunteer obstetrician gynecologist at William Beaumont Army Medical Center. We went back where we were stationed for 11 years, and I'm still operating, uh, doing vaginal surgery, my first love and my passion, and teaching residents and junior staff all my tricks of the trade in vaginal surgery. Uh, I do that as a Red Cross volunteer because in the Army, a Red Cross volunteer is covered by the Gonzales Act for malpractice, which is the same act that covers active duty military for malpractice. And so I can practice in a military hospital and be covered for malpractice uh, for that. They enjoy having me uh, in the operating room. I also help out on labor and delivery. And um, it's, uh, I do that three days a week. And uh, so I continue to contribute to take care of soldiers and their families. Uh, and when I can, advocate still for female soldiers. Uh, I still get questions. Uh, I still speak on leadership uh, and female leadership uh, with the Army. I've been invited back to Germany, uh, to the Pacific, to speak on leadership in general to commanders, to help them be better commanders. And I also speak at the tri National TRICARE Conference uh, to female leaders and upcoming uh, majors and lieutenant colonels trying to engage more females to become leaders in our army. And so I speak every year on female leadership and sort of tell my story and my war stories to get them involved and show that it can be done and that you don't have to give up everything. Because um, I have four kids, uh, two stepsons and then a son and daughter, and I have five grandkids. And I got all my kids to soccer games and Girl Scout mom and did all that besides 
full practice, and my husband was full practice general surgeon, and you still can do it all. And I show them how, give them the little tricks of the trade, like I like to say, uh, on how you can do it and still have a life and still stay sane. You've obviously had a very positive experience, but what would have been your most negative experience of being in the Army? Not many. Uh, I've been supported in the Army. Um, I've had, you know, a few episodes of maybe some sexual harassment that I dealt with uh, from department chiefs in other departments um, and that. Um, I, when I interviewed for an Air Force residency, when I try, was trying to match up with Warren, uh, I got told by an Air Force program director that I couldn't be married and be in his program because I wouldn't be able to take care of my husband. Uh, so I basically told him he could take his program and shoved it and walked out on him. Um, so, and that was another service, but uh, you know, back then when we were interviewing, um, those kind of things happened. But I really have not had negative experiences. Uh, I've been treated very fairly, uh, both by the line side as well as the military side. And it's been a truly remarkable experience. And even at the end, at, at Walter Reed with the Wounded Warriors, uh, they're only inspirational. Uh, when you see uh, the Wounded Warriors and what they go through, but their positive spirits, and how they get through their injuries and come back and have a positive outlook and uh, we get them back to ability instead of disability and they pass me on the running track because I'm only speed walking now and they can pass me. Um, they'll turn around salute and then they'll keep running. Um, it's very exciting and uh, I have no regrets over the choices I've made and I was allowed to continue to practice not as much as I would like, but uh, to practice obstetrics and gynecology. I was allowed to participate in ACOG, even as a general officer, I was allowed to represent the Army. ACOG supported me in advocating uh, for women's issues when we couldn't uh, with our government. And uh, I've just been nothing but thank you to you and to ACOG. Uh, for your support of our armed services and our service women when we've needed you to be there. So I assume if a young woman came up to you today at this meeting and said, I'm thinking about a career in the Army, you'd be very positive? I would be very positive. Uh, I believe I got farther in the Army sooner than I would have in the civilian sector. I was a program director and department chair in my 40s. Uh, I was a commander, which is basically a CEO of a hospital in my 50s. I got uh, to command four hospitals. Then I got to command whole regions of healthcare. Um, lots of responsibility, but uh, with it becomes the joy and the ability to change things on how we practice medicine and do things in the military. And you can see the fruits of those changes. You think in the future there'll be more women going into the military medical corps? It's increasing, uh, even as we see it now. We're still not at the numbers uh, as you see in uh, the civilian system. Uh, and I think a lot of that is because of deployments and, and people weigh that with having families. But uh, it is increasing. Uh, we were, when I started, we were down to 9% women. It's now uh, as high as 14% women in the military. And in the medical corps, uh, it's higher than that. We're up to about, I think, 26%. And it continues to climb. Uh, we see a lot of successful women going into command tracks and uh, into deputy commanders and into those hard to get positions. We have a lot more female general officers. I was the first female physician to become general officer. Uh, we now have had five. And so uh, it's a lot more common now. And so we're getting up there. Well, let me tell you, Carla, you have really been a trailblazer. And we're extremely proud that you're also an OBGYN. I want to thank you very much for coming and sharing your experience with us. It's just wonderful, and I'm sure that in the future, 
will find many more things for you to do. So thank you very much. Thank you.